forum is that they're going to uh, present, and if we have time left at the end, um, if you could hold your questions until then. And I think there's a timekeeper. Is there a timekeeper right here? Um, what I'm going to suggest then is that each of us, because I know Barack Sino well, and I've heard some of these other gentlemen present in the past, and they're very good in free form. So if you could each try to um, keep your comments to 15 to 20 minutes, and then um, I'll give you a, a five when we get to 15 minutes, and then um, you'll hopefully complete by 20. We'll all have time at the end for uh, folks to ask the questions they want rather than um, intermittently interrupting everyone. And uh, with that, I'm uh, going to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Shimon Samuels of the uh, Seaman uh, Lucent Health Center. Thank you. We're talking about the uh, anti-Semitism and terrorism nexus, and uh, the personal. For the post-war generation, uh, blatant anti-Semitic expression was tempered by uh, the tenth of the Holocaust. Uh, by the 1980s, however, there was a new generation, and particularly in Western Europe, those who had some form of pangs of conscience for the two greatest crimes in their history, the Holocaust and colonialism. Israel's entry into southern Lebanon in 1982 to quell the Palestinian terrorism from there uh, launched a new wave in the media, particularly media which was dominated by those of the, uh, of the period in Beltam Chow of 1968, which was the use and abuse of Holocaust language to describe the Middle East conflict. So we started to see southern Lebanon was the Sudetenland, and West Beirut was Warsaw Ghetto, and the Israeli Luftwaffe, and perhaps what summed it up best was the famous photo of the child with his arms upraised at the surrender of the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, a Portuguese caricaturist had placed a kafia on the head of the child, and uh, Stars of David in the helmets of the Nazis. So voila, a subliminal role reversal projection where the victim became the Palestinian native colonized by the Jew, who has uh, become the Nazi occupant, thus European collaborators and bystanders could be a sign of relief and say, we see, we were not so bad. What was the worst of all of this was that the Portuguese caricaturist won the 1983 Montreal uh, uh, Political Cartoon Salon a prize um, for that cartoon. <coughs> Friday, Erev Sukkot, the 3rd of October, 1980. A motorbike bomb exploded outside the Book of the Synagogue in Paris. A few minutes later, it would have resulted in a massacre as worshippers would have exited the main door. As it was, there were four victims. One was the Portuguese concierge of the hotel opposite, another was a visiting Israeli, Elisa Chagreo, mother of two sons, wife of the television producer, Micha Chagreo. And she was uh, to dine with her journalist friend, Tamar Golan, the grand dame of uh, the Paris uh, salons, who resided around the corner from Kokani. I was visiting at the time, and we set out together. She to buy some figs for that dinner. She turned right. I turned left. She turned into the Rue Copernic, to the Futura shop, where she met her death facing the cinema. The next morning, Prime Minister Raymond Bao infelicitously announced that, I quote, a heinous attack set to strike Jews in the, inside the synagogue hit four innocent French people crossing the Rue Copernic. Copernic is the liberal synagogue of the Paris elite. Madame Simon Veil, Robert Valentin, these names worship there, even if only once a year. But this was a wake up. It led to the establishment of Jewish defense structures, as it was the first of a wave of post Holocaust pogroms uh, that um, I think you could see continuing in a continuum. It was a continuum to the army in Buenos Aires and uh, in the synagogues in Istanbul. But also, Copernic began 73 shootings and bombings of Jewish targets across Western Europe, 29 of which were in France, most in Paris, over the next two years. They ended in August of 1982 with a machine gunning uh, by 
four Arabs marching down the Wood of Osier, the main street of the Jewish Quarter, with six dead and 22 in. Why did they end? Why did the wave come to an end in August of 1982? It was an unthought of byproduct of Israel's entry into the southern Lebanon. In several of the PLO camps, one notably Bir Hassan, you had European terrorists, both of the extreme left and the extreme right, being trained. They fled as the Israelis entered. They fled back to Europe. When they returned home, they didn't strike Jews. They needed money. They struck banks and NATO installations, embassies, and governments cracked down. And as we heard so many times here, what starts with the Jews doesn't end with the Jews. Vichy Pirat, a program in France, plastered Action Direct, Baden Meinhof in Germany, the Red Brigades in Italy. This was the revenge against terrorists. And Copernic became a code word that led to a new French Jewish consciousness, arguably the fall of uh, the presidency of Giscard in 1981. It was a threshold that portended the future in the terms of anti Semitism, terrorism, nexus. For years, it was believed that Copernic was perpetrated by the extreme right. The bomber has now allegedly been identified as a Lebanese academic, uh, Palestinian extraction, living in Canada, uh, a former member of the PFLP. French efforts to extradite him have met with delays. It's an appropriate concern for an organization called the Simon Wisdoms. Simon used to ask at the start of Nazi war criminal trials that the judge remove the blind statue of justice carrying the scales. The scales symbolize an equilibrium between crime and punishment, and there could not be such an equilibrium between atrocity and the punishment. Sentence. Flash forward. On the si December the 6th, 2001, three months after the Durban Hate Fest, I was uh, present at the last meeting of the NGO Forum the, of the International Steering Committee in Geneva. I was the only Jew elected to that uh, Forum uh, Steering Committee. I had been uh, expelled in uh, Durban itself. Um, and, but I was invited to that last meeting uh, three months later in Geneva. And there I became privy to a document. It was an eight point plan attacking Israel as the last bastion of apartheid. It was a plan for Durban too supposed to be 10 years hence, E10. It included educational, economic, cultural, diplomatic, and legal campaigns to demonize, boycott, and isolate the Jewish state. And legal measures began with sporadic and so far successful attempts to arrest IDF reserve officers and political leaders in countries of universal goods. In 2005, I was charged with criminal defamation by a Franco-Palestinian charity, in quotes. It was designated, that charity, by the United States, Canada, and uh, Australia as a terrorist organization, and my sentence in the first round was one symbolic euro, which was politically too expensive. I won on appeal. I, the other side also appealed, and I was taken to the French Supreme Court, where last July I was finally acquitted. Now it's probable that the organization will take France to the uh, European Court in Strasbourg and they wish to deserve it. This long, agonizing, and costly experience was emblematic of an epidemic of lawsuits, which were not just uh, uh, against me, they were designed to intimidate and silence any pro-Jewish or pro-Zionist or friends. The charges against me were replicated against seven other targets, uh, journalists, authors, a Christian website, Parallel were the suits and countersuits of the Mohammed Ordura case. You all know that story about the child who was ostensibly killed. Um, and I get now, some denote such cases as lawfare. I prefer to call them judicial jihad because they are resonating with Islamic concepts. The dawah. The dawah is to preach, but it's not only to preach, it's also the whole social structure of Hamas, the non military branch through its hospitals, its schools, its mosques, that are the underpinnings of jihad. That is juridical jihad. Uh, and I think that we'll all see much more of this. Now, how did I come to this organization soon? Simon Wiesenthal sent a monitors annually, and my colleague over there, Mark 
Sites Clinic server. And it uh, hates sites worldwide for an annual CD run which is designated for law enforcement and educators. I had found that the UOIF, the Union of Islamic Organizations in France, was had a website replete with anti Semitism. Just an example Jews are in this lobby, a true cancer, a tumor for the planet and humanity, all multinationals are in the hands of French Zionists implicated in. Uh, financing Zionist terrorist operations, presidential electoral campaigns, as puppets, uh, you know. I also found that the UIF had created an organization, a sub-organization called the CBSP. The Council de Bienfaisance, Welfare, et Sécurité, assistant to the Palestinians, to fund the public funds to Palestine. Every year in the Bourget airfield, they hold the annual assembly of the Muslims of France. So, of course, we went. And we found the huge CBS stand, it wasn't a stand, it was a huge building, in the shape of the Mosque of Aqsa. And 50,000 people running around, many of them uh, veiled, uh, with pishkas in the shape of the mosque, taking money. Also, in that, on that stand, they were selling anti-Semitic books, tapes, cassettes in Arabic and in French, um, we purchased some of them. This one is called Atiyaf al Istishkhad. Istishkhad is reflexive. You won't know Shahid. Shahada, Shahid, Mata. Istishkhad means suicide. So, I got a report. Also, uh, uh, there they were doing something else. They were recruiting young French uh, Muslims for summer camps in Palestine. Uh, I got a report in October 2004 for then Interior Minister Dominique de Vipin. Uh, which was called the true face of the UOIF. And very quickly, police arrived, and they arrived to interrogate me because the report had been leaked to the website. And they had lifted one line. The CBSP, this pro-Palestinian charity, under the guise of 50 euros uh, for orphans, was financing suicide terrorists of Hamas. So I had to now satisfy in court four conditions. French defamation law is very specific. You have to satisfy all four in order to be acquitted. The first is lack of animosity. Well, I sit on an EU emanation called the European Network Against Racism. Um, I, uh, one of my witnesses was the Imam of Rome. Uh, I sit on a World Economic Forum body, which is 50 Muslims and 50 non-Muslims, the C100. So I had no animosity. The second was utility. But my expose was aimed to inform donors that their money was going illegally to charities of an organization that had been classified by the European Union as a terrorist organization, Hamas. Next came plausibility. I'm not a detective, I'm not a secret agent. I was doing my work as a researcher, possibly a journalist, and therefore I had to be plausible. I submitted 152 exhibits. That was plausible, showed I did my homework. The fourth was prudence. Very wide concept. How do you define prudence? Well, there is where I fell apart. It was on this point that the, the other side argued. I should have known that the minister had his own intelligent sources and did not need my input. Well, on the second round, we were able to prove that he had spoken in a radio program a week after I submitted the report about the report on Europe. One would show that he took it seriously, but that was in the appeal process. I was to discover that in the court you had to present something by peeling the onion because this is a multi-layered process. And also the court sympathies politically were clear and they demanded simplification. This is a simple issue. Yoni Fiegel, who advised me in the early stages of this, yesterday or the day before, I don't remember, he showed a chart. Well, I had also made such a chart, this is it in small, uh, showing that under the Union of Good, headed by Sheikh Karadawi, you've heard of him, he is the Imam of Al Jazeera, known as the liberal women's rabbi, Imam, because he said that um, women have the right against the objection of their husbands to commit suicide, jihad, if they so wish. Very liberal. Okay. Um, well, he, the money is collected by the sister organizations which were closed down in the United States, in Germany, Netherlands, and Denmark, 
uh, still active in the UK and in France. And then the money is filtered down umbrella bodies, which are geographical, in Palestine, in Holland, in Bethlehem, etc., to associations which are clearly identified with um, uh, Hamas. Using principally, but not only, the website of the Intelligence and Terrorism Information Center, so it was Center of Special Studies, and that's Leah, uh, it took me several months to establish the smoking gun. Now, it, it was on the wall. Okay. Uh, up there we have a poster in a Hamas Legendat Zakat, a, 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 a charitable organization in Turkai. This is of a suicide bomber who in uh, 2001 took the lives of four people and injured many more in the Afula bus station. Uh, and it says that he is on his way to paradise with his wedding with the black eyes, but it also says that he is an Amalia Istishadia, which means suicide mission. So it's unambiguous. <clears throat> okay, now um, let me go to the next one. Okay, he, here, this was another document, and I did my own research on this, and it gave passion. Uh, this is a list of 100 orphans financed by CPSP, the French organization, uh, in basically around Geneva. And if I go down to number 65 and 66, according to the names, uh, the names match to show, and also the date of his suicide mission match to show that these are two children of the man whom I showed you in the poster. So we saw here on a document that said, uh, was generous the generosity of the French donors, two children who received, in effect, a life insurance. Uh, the next document, which I don't have to put up on the wall, unfortunately, uh, is a, a Saudi document, which I found, uh, of some of 110 recipients of 20,000 riyals from the Saudi government to Shahid. In this case, number 99 was the widow of the man on the wall. I then uh, found announcements in the Palestinian press thanking the CBSP for its generosity, one from the family. Finally, no, uh, um, before that, I found a letter from Abu Mazen in the name of Yasser Arafat to the King of Saudi Arabia requesting that Saudi stop its awards of money to Hamas Shahids. And a letter from President Chirac to the Palestinian ambassador in France saying that he would never close down the CPSB because of its holy work. That we didn't submit to the court because if the president said that, why should the judge do otherwise? A letter from the Credit Lyonnais Bank that they closed the CPSB account on suspicion of funding terrorism because there was a pending <coughs> action suit against them by the victims of terrorism in France. But the best of all, best of, all of the four bereaved families of Nizar Muhammad's suicide, one was French. So we argued that yes, Nizam Muhammad was given by French donors a life insurance policy, but there were other orphans, the Jewish orphans, who had no such treatment for compensation. Also, I have here, if anybody's interested, charts that were prepared to spoon feed the judges the names of each regional charity, the documents and the dates with backup of checks and bank transfers to associations that were clearly headed by, with names, members and activists for Hamas. The week before the trial, I met with the editor of a satirical weekly. Uh, he was being sued by the same plaintiff for reprinting the Mohammed cartoons. He said to me, I guarantee I will win and you will lose. The left is with me. They will never let me be sentenced for group defamation. The plaintiff will then go to the authorities to protest my victory, and they will say, well, there was balance. The sign of wisdom are sent lost, the blind statue of justice. Before the trial, I visited a good friend in the Quai d'Orsay, the French Foreign Office, and I told him the story, and he said, help us to help you. Win the case, and we will close them down. Well, after my Supreme Court victory, I go to him. There was no answer. 
The purpose of the exercise was simple. It was to intimidate. The, I, I could write a book about this. I have enough material and uh, expertise in, in, the, uh, in that material. However, if I write a book, there's no question, I would be sued. If you have French law, you could be sued repeatedly. Okay, now towards the conclusions. The uh, recent allegations of the uh, uh, IDF harvesting body organs, they up the ante on defamation. The Goldstone opens the floodgates for political, juridical jihad in national courts, in uh, UN uh, agencies, and even perhaps to go to the International Criminal Court in the Hague. It is time to plan a strategy of legal counter-engagement. The propagators of deliberate slurs targeting Israel and by association world jury must realize that they may incur a price. Announcements of litigation, not even litigation, but announcement of possible litigation by a group of IDF officers against the French left-wing weekly, the Nouvel Observateur, led to an apology for calling the IDF an army of rapists. So it shows what even the concept, the idea that there may be costly legal proceedings can do. And legal suits are costly. I was fortunate to have loyal supporters who uh, helped me with a war chest. We wasted 120, 125,000 euro on this exercise. The other side's attorneys were pro bono because they are member ideologues of the association. I believe that a consortium of the best philo Semitic and pro-Israel legal brains should be on call to judge the ramifications in the most appropriate jurisdictions to use the courts in ad hominem, defamation, in group libel, and even in cases of anti-Semitic terrorism. I believe that those attacks will grow, basically because it is inevitable that what I call the nests of Gaza in European <coughs> cities will hatch. In 1997, the United States suggested that Israel's laws on the trial of Nazi war criminals endowed it with appropriate universal jurisprudence to prosecute the recently captured Cambodian genocidist Pol Pot. It was an interesting concept. Jerusalem declined. But these are the very legal tools that the Simon Wiesenthal Center used to propose that Israel indicate to Argentina that it might consider prosecuting the six Iranians indicted in the Buenos Aires Jewish Center bombing, that they need not be sent to Argentina, but they could be sent to Israel, like Israel could demand the extradition. <clears throat> and especially in view of Interpol's agreement that these fugitives could be tried as in third nation tribunals. And we have here among us, I don't know if he's in this session, but we have uh, uh, the public prosecutor uh, investigating the Amir case from Argentina. Conspiracy theories on the radio and television, we've had uh, several in Britain, the uh, Israeli lobby. Body organ slander in the Swedish and Ukrainian press and other libels, whatever, must be countered not mischievously, but judiciously, selectively. Erwin Kotler last night spoke about Sedek Sedek Tildorf, justice, justice, thou shalt pursue. And I believe that that axiom is an important weapon to push back to the judicial jihad. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shimon. Uh, next up, we have Michael Wine of uh, Community Service Trust discussing uh, progress in combating anti-Semitism at the international level. Mm -hmm. My work increasingly focuses these days on uh, diplomacy and within intergovernmental organizations. Um, in making the remarks that I do, I'm mindful of the comments that, that were made uh, by others in the last few days, particularly those of Walter Reich and Anne Bajewski. And the warnings that, uh, that they gave. But what I want to do is to examine the effectiveness, the long-term effectiveness, or otherwise, uh, of diplomacy in combating anti-Semitism. 
the organizations that I work within and for, well, I'm employed by the Community Security Trust uh, in the UK and the Board of Deputies of British Jews. Uh, I also uh, do a lot of work uh, within these intergovernmental organizations. Um, and they employ acronyms uh, to uh, a worrying extent. And I will use these acronyms, but uh, the first time I mention any of the organizations or the initiatives, uh, I'll spell it out and thereafter just use the acronym. Following the 2001 Durban Conference, Jewish organizations sought redress at the international level, and the resultant diplomatic offensive against anti-Semitism has therefore been carried out in part through this medium. Some international organizations play a more effective role than others, but the initiatives have been more than de uh, declaratory. They involve ground-level programs within territories which have historically provided fertile territory for anti-Semitism. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, was the first of these organizations to recognize and react to the changing circumstances. In June 1990, the foreign ministers of the then participating states of the conference on their security and cooperation in Europe met in Copenhagen to adopt the Copenhagen Declaration, which gave force to their concern that the so-called human dimension could play a role in undermining security within and between states. They recognized that, and I quote, the protection and promotion of human rights is one of the basic purposes of government. The Declaration accordingly called on, participa on participating states to clearly and unequivocally condemn totalitarianism, racial and ethnic hatred, anti-Semitism, xenophobia and discrimination, and to take measures including the adoption in conformity with their constitutional systems and their international obligations of such laws as may be necessary to provide protection against any acts that constitute incitement to violence against persons or groups based on national, ethnic, or religious discrimination, hostility, or hatred, including anti-Semitism. The end of the quote. As anti-Semitic incidents and violence rose worldwide, but especially in Europe, during the latter part of the 1990s, the OSCE Foreign Ministerial Conference in Porto in December 2002 noted government's concerns over the manifestations of aggressive nationalism, racism, chauvinism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, and violent extremism, wherever they may occur. The statement, however, did more than express concern. It went on to authorize the OSCE to take action and to ensure effective follow-up via, the, human, uh, via the, the annual Human Dimension meetings and seminars organized by the agency's human rights affiliate, the Organization for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, known as ODIA. A consequence, therefore, was the 2003 Vienna meeting on anti-Semitism, which was the first high-level conference devoted specifically to anti-Semitism. The meeting was preceded by a two-day seminar on human rights and anti-Semitism, organized by the Jacob Blaustein Institute, at which Jewish representatives sought to engage with and enlist the support of the major international human rights groups, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. The meeting was less than successful, and in the end, the Jewish groups were unable to garner any real support from the international human rights groups, a situation which still prevails. The Vienna meeting, however, required a proper follow-up, an event which would engage governments at the highest level and ensure continuing support for programmes. This led to the 2004 Berlin Conference, and its final declaration noted unambiguously that, and I quote, international developments or political issues including those in Israel or elsewhere in the Middle East, never justify anti-Semitism. This broke the logjam, pointing to the source of much new anti-Semitism. It also permitted participating states to collect and maintain reliable data on anti-Semitic and other hate crimes, and to work with the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly to determine appropriate periodical reviews of anti-Semitism. It tasked ODIA to work systematically on collecting and disseminating information, identifying best practice for preventing and responding to anti-Semitism, and, if requested, to offer advice to participating states. 
The first step in pursuing these aims was the Paris meeting on Cyber Aid two months later, which examined the increasing use of the internet to promote anti-Semitism and other forms of hatred. On this occasion, the OSCE failed to follow up the recommendations, and it took until March of this year for the organization to hold its second experts meeting on the same subject. The outcome of that will be a ministerial declaration on combating uh, cyber hate, uh, which I'm about to start negotiating uh, with a colleague with uh, the US State Department on behalf of the OSCE. The Berlin Conference was followed by three more high-level conferences in Cordoba, Bucharest, and Astana, which have forced four states to demonstrate their progress, or otherwise, in combating anti-Semitism. Intermittent expert meetings are also held to draw attention to emerging concerns and to assist the personal representative on anti-Semitism to the OSCE chairman in office. ODN now publishes a series of important reports, including the annual hate crimes in the OSCE region report, which collects and analyzes data from member states and NGOs, and which includes a substantial section on anti-Semitism. The report also measures progress against agreed targets, such as adherence to national and international instruments. In addition, ODIA publishes other reports, education on the Holocaust and anti-Semitism, hate crime laws, practical guide, and a series of school books for high school students, so far in nine languages. The ODIA Tolerance and Non-Discrimination Information Service, ANDIS, uh, database contains national legislation against hate crime, model legislation for states which have yet to draft such legislation, and over two million other pieces of relevant information. I turn now to the European Union. Its early efforts in confronting anti-Semitism were fraught with problems. But they've made some positive efforts uh, since then to redress that balance. The 2003 report on manifestations of anti-Semitism in the European Union, published by the European Monitoring Centre, which is known as EUMC, but has since been renamed the Fundamental Rights Agency, known as FRA, um, in 2007, was in fact two reports. Uh, a country analysis prepared by Berlin University, uh, and a report on perceptions of anti-Semitism in the European Union. These reports were reasonable given the, the short time allowed uh, for their preparation, but controversy erupted when the EUMC sought to bury the first report, delay publication of the second, and then, in response to criticism, published both with a press release which was at variance with the assessments made by the report's authors. What the EUMC have failed to understand is that anti-Semitism is now frequently, as we have heard, a consequence of the overspill of Middle East tension and is increasingly promoted by Islamists and others. Muslims also suffer from prejudice, and the EUMC, a body established to monitor this phenomenon as well, just found difficulty in reconciling the fact that victims of one sort of prejudice could be responsible for promoting another form of prejudice. Since 2004, FRA has published a useful annual review of anti-Semitism uh, based on reports submitted by the Raxi Network of National Focal Points. But as with the annual OSCE report, it fails to uh, provide a complete picture as too many states are still incapable of or unwilling to submit data. We can talk a little bit about that in Q&A if, if people want to explore those, uh, that, that arena and the reasons for that situation. A real lasting benefit, however, could be the working definition of anti-Semitism. When the EUMC considered their first report in 2003, they found that many respondents couldn't define anti-Semitism in today's political climate. They also lamented the fact that no two experts could define anti-Semitism in the same way. Uh, they therefore asked selected Jewish NGOs and academics to provide a simple working definition that would encompass anti-Semitic demonization of Israel and which could be used by their rats and network of national focal points and by law enforcement agencies. Although it was never intended that the definition be legislated, it has nevertheless been adopted as a working guide by the OSCE, the US State Department, and is now under consideration by the German Expert Commission on Anti-Semitism. Another major step forward within the EU is expected when the Common Framework decision comes into effect in the, uh, this November. 
Although it's been much watered down from the original stronger draft, it nevertheless places on all EU member states a requirement to legislate against the promotion of hatred, including anti-Semitism, Holocaust denial, and denial of genocide. The Council of Europe, with a larger membership than the EU, has also assisted by passing policy resolutions condemning anti-Semitism. But its racism monitoring body, European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, ECRI, has taken on the issue in an effective and really quite business-like manner. Their mission is to monitor member states' adherence to European legislation and the European Convention on Human Rights, in particular. It does so by four yearly reviews of states' compliance with European and their own national legal instruments, as well as occasional thematic recommendations. Member states are expected to act on ECRI recommendations, and the current third cycle of country reports is paying particular attention to the improvements made by members over the 12-year cycle to date. In 2004, ECRI also published a general policy recommendation on combating anti-Semitism, which is an advisory to member states and spells out the actions to expect member states and the criminal justice agencies to take. The 2010 ECRI Review of Progress notes that its three-pronged programme of activities, country reports, thematic reports, and engagement with civil society, has allowed it to promote real legislative process and effective use of that legislation. Now let me turn to the United Nations. Latterly, as you have heard, by any standard, it's been ineffective in defending human rights. But it has nevertheless made a contribution to combating anti-Semitism. Several denunciations, as you have heard, in the context of denouncing racism in 2002 and 2005, were followed by the more practical decision to establish the International Day of Commemoration for Holocaust Victims on 27th of January, and an unequivocal condemnation of Holocaust denial signed by all member states except Iran in 2005. Even the ridiculous 2009 Durban follow-on conference attempted to move on from the ill-fated Durban conference by calling on member states to counter anti-Semitism, to take measures to prevent the emergence of movements promoting hatred, and to implement General Assembly resolutions on Holocaust commemoration and Holocaust denial. Another initiative, the Stockholm International Forum on the Holocaust in 2000 was among the most practical and long-lasting of outcomes in international diplomacy, and one which, like some of the others that I've mentioned, stemmed not from the Jewish urging, but from the concerns of statesmen. There are friends out there, I, I assure you. Initiated by the then Swedish Prime Minister, the Forum agreed to establish an international task force to ensure that states recognize the magnitude of the Holocaust and its everlasting scarring effect on the Jews and humanity as a whole. So far, 27 states have signed the Stockholm Declaration and put in place annual Holocaust commemoration and educational programs. To ensure enlargement and consistency, a permanent office was established in Berlin, funded by the German government and with a revolving chairmanship shared by signatory states. Finally, it should be noted that the pressure parliamentarians exert on governments and international agencies has been significant. The London Declaration, signed by 125 parliamentarians from 40 countries following the first London Conference on Antisemitism in London, organised by the Interparliamentary Coalition for Combating Antisemitism in February of last year, has now led to the establishment of a European parliamentary intergroup to fight antisemitism. The recognition that racism starts with the Jews but could destroy civilization was spelled out by its two co-founders, the German MEP Martin Schulz and the former Bundestag member Gerd Weisskirch. Both stressed the need for urgent action, which depends in part on the pressure parliamentarians exert on their governments. Looking back, it might be argued that 10 years' diplomatic effort to counter anti-Semitism has been of little avail given the dramatic increase in incidents and the deterioration in discourse, particularly following Operation Castellet. I think, however, that would be to miss the point. At the turn of the millennium, governments were recognised to even recognise that anti-Semitism was growing again. 
They could only see anti-Semitism through the prism of the far right, which was in retreat politically, and not through that of, and of Islamism and the left, which were then in the ascendant. They also underestimated the phenomenal power of information and communication technologies and the viral nature of social networking uh, internet sites. Since then, states have recognized the dangers to society's health by not combating the phenomenon, have agreed a common yardstick by which anti-Semitism can be defined and measured, and recognized that it now comes from new and different directions. Many have also legislated against incitement of anti-Semitism in its various forms, including Holocaust denial. Those who have not done so, in Europe at least, will have to do so by the end of this year. It must also be recognised that none of these individual initiatives can, on their own, defeat anti-Semitism. Taken together over a period, and with others still to come, there is still a establishing a diplomatic and political climate that will more effectively counter anti-Semitism and make states and the criminal justice agencies respond more effectively. There have been setbacks, of course. Many states are still incapable of or un unable to measure anti-Semitism, despite having agreed to do so. I often see the disconnect between foreign ministries and their aspirations and the practical uh, results of those aspirations and the signing of international instruments uh, within interior ministries and justice ministries. It's as though one branch of government doesn't talk to another. Um, and foreign ministries are signing governments up uh, to agreements uh, which really ought to be properly discussed uh, when they get back home, but I think sometimes aren't. Some states still con uh, grapple with the concept of hate crime itself. Uh, as Lars Rensman uh, informed us in his session before lunch uh, in, in this room, um, collecting data uh, is difficult. States are required now to note hate crimes specifically in their penal code or provide their courts with the power to enhance penalties if there's evidence of bias on the part of an offender. It needs sensitization and training for police prosecutors in the judiciary to recognise the aggravated element and criminal justice agencies need coordinated and linked systems to record the crimes, incidents and outcomes. Moreover, they are required by international agreement to disaggregate the data so that it may be analysed by victim group. Some states just do not allow uh, such a uh, disaggregation because of data pri uh, privacy protection requirements or because of the secular nature of the state for cohesion Philosophic reason, uh, as in France, denies recognition of faith and the particularity of faith groups in society. Despite their declared wish to contribute, some states are therefore precluded from providing the data required for analysis at this time. And therefore, the overall picture is lacking in clarity, although the broad outlines are obviously clear. In recognition of this, the OSCE, ECRI and FRA therefore encourage the work of NGOs and rely on their vital work in augmenting uh, the data provided by state agencies. Additionally, FRA is now considering widespread polling on perceptions of anti-Semitism within Jewish communities, following polling projects within other minority communities. These projects recognize that official bodies may not be able to provide reliable and timely data, and that NGOs have limited capacity Instead, they're designed to provide an overview of minority communities' experiences and perceptions. These shortcomings are recognised by FRA and the OSC. And for that reason, the session on combating anti-Semitism at the recent uh, OSC high-level conference in Astana called in on participating states into Asia to implement the 2004 Berlin Declaration and record and prosecute anti-Semitic and other hate crime sign and implement the Stockholm Declaration on the Holocaust Remembrance and the ICCA London Declaration, as well as promoting the working definition. It noted, did the Astana Declaration, that participating states seem to lack the political will to implement their commitments on the topic of anti-Semitism. And it's this second setback, I think, that is the most apparent. Uh, it's the fatigue among states. Uh, 
of despite concern of the growing anti-Semitism, uh, our concerns have been overtaken amongst governments and by NGOs by concern for mounting violence against Roma and Sinti, the massively under-researched violence against the disabled, and violence against Muslim communities. Progress in monitoring combating anti-Semitism may therefore slow down as governments and the criminal agencies and educational systems are put under pressure to adapt, to innovate and enlarge their work in a recessionary climate. Lastly, and in conclusion, I would say that the progress made in confronting and combating anti-Semitism since the 1990s has been neither continuous nor consistent. But without the determination of some governments, international agencies and a handful of Jewish NGOs, the progress made would not, thus far would not have been possible. Thank you. Next uh, speaker is Dr. Michael Katzen, who hails from the Jewish Federation of Metropolitan Chicago, and he's going to discuss the language of new anti-Semitism. Um, I was a student in the early 1980s and mid-1980s at the University of Chicago on the south side, and I got to see the pamphlets and the posters that were distributed by the Nation of Islam that, and what were distributed by Trinity Church. Um, unfortunately, I got to see the early forms of, of an anti-Semitism that is woven its way into um, all the way right up to the White House. The President of the United States is thinking is clearly influenced by this, and certainly many members of his cabinet. So I look forward to your comments. So you mentioned some of our uh, our local notables. Uh, Arthur Butzman's name was uh, mentioned earlier today as another. Um, and uh, Norman Finkelstein, of course, was recently with us. And uh, the list goes on. Uh, I prepared this, and it turned out to be longer than it uh, would have uh, been appropriate for this session, and rather than cutting it short throughout, what I uh, determined to do was just to skip what in effect is the first third. Um, it's in that part that I mentioned, uh, Farrakhan and uh, uh, some of the other things, but mostly what I do there, I begin with the death, my, my thesis, uh, which is one that, that we've heard in other ways too, that I'm dealing with classic. Uh, and the way classic anti-Semitism has changed in the effect that, that uh, Israel has become the target rather than individual Jews, and I want to talk about ways that's reflected in the use of language. In my opening pages, uh, I, I talked about some elements of Christian anti-Semitism uh, being uh, reborn uh, in this fashion, uh, and I go on with other examples and especially spend time uh, on the Islamic world, which we've heard a great deal about already in this conference, so um, that's another way that I, I'm, uh, I'm comfortable uh, skipping uh, a lot of that, knowing that the ground has been laid in that way. Um, I'll jump in and, uh, in the middle, in effect, but I think uh, I think it'll work, and uh, so let me just move on in that way. Uh, Ahmadinejad is often regarded as a crackpot as a figure from another century, if not from another world. But the kind of ideas that he and his Hamas counterparts convey is becoming more and more common in the mainstream. This is so not only in England and Europe, where we have come to expect it, but in the US as well. And that's where uh, I think maybe I do differ from uh, much of uh, what we've heard, uh, where I'm moving to mainstream and moving to the US. For one thing, that is especially true for internet postings where writers can give rein to unfiltered vituperation. And so, for example, John Petrus, a former professor of sociology at Binghamton University, can write in an internet newsletter called Dissident Voice that Alana Kagan's, I'm quoting Alana Kagan's ties to the staunchly Zionist faculty at both Chicago and Harvard law schools account for her meteoric promotions to tenure, deanship, and now the US Supreme Court. And he can go on to link those advances to what he calls her ethnic connections and to conclude that, quote, another active pro-Zionist advocate on the court will provide a legal cover for the advance of Zionist dictated authoritarianism over the American people. Even respected academics working through mainstream publications, not just on the internet, are joining the chorus in their way these days. In what was first a long article published in England, then a book published and widely circulated in the US, professors John Mearsheimer and other local, 
Uh, and Stephen Waltz talked about the so-called Israel lobby in more veiled language that, though they repeatedly deny meaning it to be heard that way, still sounds an awful lot like the way Jews and Zionists are portrayed by Hamas, Ahmadinejad, and the legion of other echoes, uh, echoers of the concepts crystallized by the protocols of the learned elders of Zion, which I had talked about earlier too. In the Mearsheimer Walt construction, the supporters of Israel come together to exert an influence powerful enough to lead the United States to ignore its own interest in the Middle East and the world, and instead to be driven by what the lobby sees as in Israel's interest. They may wish to assert that they do not believe there is a Jewish cabal or conspiracy, and that in their minds the Israel lobby is like any other interest group or ethnic lobby. Still, for them, the members of the so-called Israel lobby, quote, are in an unusually favorable position to influence foreign policy, while what sets that lobby apart is its extraordinary effectiveness, end, end quote. In fact, throughout their book, Israel supporters are portrayed as constituting a powerful force undermining America's well-being, with the members of that lobby skillful enough to cover up their behind-the-scenes subterfuge from others. The Hamas Charter calls it sabotage. Mearsheimer and Walt may not overtly use the term in their text, but through their subtext, they certainly convey the idea. Since gaining wider notice thanks to the book, Mearsheimer has continued to advance its themes, sometimes more bluntly. Quote, in short, he said in a speech at the Palestine Center in Washington this past April, President Obama is no match for the lobby. In a more recent post on his blog, he proclaimed that the lobby believes it can finesse any issue. America's interests and Israel, Israel's interests are going to continue to diverge. An end result of that is that the lobby is going to have to work overtime to cover that up. In the April speech, Mearsheimer talked about what he described as the inevitability of Israel's becoming an apartheid state entering into territory widely occupied today by those who have discovered that the term is an especially useful slur. In so doing, he himself engaged in a couple of revealing maneuvers. First, he switched from talking about Israel and apartheid in the future subjunctive, as though it is only a hypothetical possibility, to doing so in the present tense, using a grammatical double move to make it sound like Israel has already become an apartheid state, while leaving himself room to deny having said that. Secondly, he demonstrated how scornfully he regards Israel's mainstream supporters by using name-calling derived from the South African experience. Thus, after listing what he calls righteous Jews, quote unquote, including people who are prepared to sharply attack Israel and in some cases question its right to exist, Noam Chomsky and others, he said, quote, on the other side, we have the new Afrikaners, who will support Israel even if it is an apartheid state. The people on this list are not only personalities who might fairly be placed toward the right wing of the political spectrum, but also others who would not belong there. And Mearsheimer includes on the list, quote, individuals who head the Israel lobby's major organizations. Those are the Jewish community's organizations. Here it is worth citing Anthony Julius's observation that, quote, the master trope that there are good Jews and bad Jews has been continuous in the political culture for at least the last hundred years. It is itself an anti-Semitic construction. The evocation of apartheid, of course, conjures up the racist regime of South Africa, which ultimately was overthrown. Numerous scholars have pointed to the differences between contemporary Israel and that regime, but despite that, references to that practice and use of the word have itself uh, have, so, excuse me, itself have become increasingly common as a way to malign Israel and ultimately deny its legitimacy. It is one of the central ways that Israel and its supporters are linguistically tarred and feathered today in an age where racism is the prototypical sin in apartheid era South Africa, the model of a regime that did not deserve to exist. Expressions of Israel-connected anti-Semitism keep turning up these days even or perhaps one might say particularly from celebrities who get widespread attention in our culture. Thus, when a rabbi come camera toting YouTube journalist asked the aging but still active Helen Thomas, a respected journalist despite her cantankerous style, for a comment on Israel, she replied by saying, 
tell them to get the hell out of Palestine and go home to Poland, Germany, America, and everywhere else. As commentators such as Jeffrey Goldberg and Shelby Steele have observed, this comment reveals both the denial of Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state and its sensitivity to, if not blatant, ignorance of the realities of the Holocaust and its effects. Coincidentally enough, within a week or so of the Thomas incident, a Jewish dance group, ironically named Felger Ring, was stoned, as we heard earlier today, by the way, on the previous session, was stoned while attempting to perform in the German city of Hanover when attacking youths, reportedly young Muslims themselves, well in touch with the language of the traditional anti-Semitism of that landscape, shouted Juden Raus. Even more recently, in another verbal outpouring that the perpetrator later said he regretted, the American film writer and director Oliver Stone told the London Times that though Hitler did far more damage to the Russians than the Jewish people, there was a greater focus on the Holocaust because of the Jewish domination of the media. He continued, there's a major lobby in the United States, in, in the uh, Mearsheimer and Walt Bain, uh, quote, they are hard workers, they stay on top of every comment, the most powerful lobby in Washington. Israel has fucked up U.S. foreign policy for years. Whatever pro forma retraction Stone may have offered him, what he said afterwards, he really did not totally exonerate himself from the implications of all that he had been quoted as saying in the interview. The fact is that his readiness to come out with such comments demonstrate the extent to which these attitudes and the kind of language used to convey them seem to be out there these days. The fact that both the Thomas and Stone comments were connected with the Holocaust is not an incidental matter. Increasingly, as we heard earlier today from Dina Parat, the Holocaust context has become a dominating component of the new anti-Semitism. The linguistic trope I wish to focus on here has to do with the way in which the Nazi war against the Jews, surely one of the most devastating expressions of anti-Semitism in all of Jewish history, as well as one of the most cataclysm cataclysmic events of the 20th century, is today itself being used to harm the Jewish people and the nation state that they established in their ancient homeland following World War II. Still, it, uh, then I'm, I actually cut and show the, old, the history of this that Shimon Samuels gave us a sense, actually, going back to the Lebanon, uh, we're kind of Lebanon, uh, Israel going into Lebanon, first war, but then I go on. Still, it has pretty much been since the 1990s, following the collapse of the Soviet Union, and especially during the past decade, that the Israel-Nazi analogy has become a major motif in the West, as well as in the Islamic world, which is where much of the emphasis of this conference has been until now. <coughs> it is now a leading weapon in the propaganda assault against Israel, directed by activist Palestinians and other Muslims who have made their way to the West, and by radical left-wing individuals and groups. With Nazism widely recognized as the most profound manifestation of evil in modern times, the painting of Zionism as Nazism reborn and Israel as the new Nazi Germany is an attempt to transfer the substance of that evil. And so it is that were you to have witnessed anti-Israel rallies in the streets, not just of European metropolises, but North American cities as well, subsequent to Israel's military advance into Gaza in late December and early January 2009-10, or following the recent episode involving the Turkish flotilla, you would have seen demonstrators waving the flags of Hamas and Hezbollah while holding signs with anti-Semitic content, including many of them bearing images equating the swastika and the Star of David and calling Gaza the new Warsaw Ghetto, labeling Israel soldiers the new stormtroopers and accusing Israel of Nazi-like genocide. Dominating the rhetoric of these rallies, such signage, along with the chanting and speeches of the rallies, conveyed not sympathy for the Palestinians as much as hatred for Israel and its supporters. And meanwhile, this trope, too, has made its way into the mainstream, again, often in the hands of cartoonists like Pat Oliphant, who at the time of Operation Cast Lead drew an image of a headless, brutal stormtrooper to characterize Israel's behavior in Gaza. In using swastikas and images of stormtroopers to portray Israel and its supporters, 
Israel's enemies have appropriated motifs with a power that Hitler exploited in his time. It is the power of a stark, twisted cross, the power of cruel Hitler saluting soldiers in black boots, with which the power of the magnetizing madman Hitler himself is associated. Through the years, neo-Nazis and other adversaries of the Jewish people have used the swastika to hurt individual Jews, painting swastikas on Jewish institutions, for example, as a form of anti-Semitic expression. Now, however, the swastika is used not just against Jews, but when attached to the state of Israel to portray Jews. It is not just a vehicle for inflicting pain on Jews by trying to create the impression that their worst tormentors have returned, but a way to insultingly accuse them of having become those tormentors themselves. In the new equation, it should be added, not only have the Jews become the Nazis, but they have been replaced by new Jews, by new victims, namely the Palestinians, who are regarded as the true heirs to the promised land. Seen this way, the Nazi Israel analogy is a contemporary equivalent of the replacement the excuse me, the replacement theology which drove Christian anti-Semitism for centuries, and that thus can be likened to other current expressions of supersessionism. The equation also create, creates a particular form of literal Holocaust revisionism, it can be suggested. That is a way to lead the world to revise its thoughts and feelings about the Holocaust. For as this realignment of roles goes on, the Holocaust ceases to be regarded as the historic event it was, with facts and details to be learned about. It rather becomes a repository of images, of symbols of innocence and evil, to be evoked and applied in however twisted a way one chooses to suit one's ideological purposes. In a rather postmodern fashion, it becomes in some a toolbox full of icons to be taken out and assigned while the reality of the Holocaust, if not actively denied, melts away. Traditional anti-Semitism demonized and scapegoated individual Jews and the Jewish people, regarding them as the evil other responsible for the ills of society and the world. And the new anti-Semitism uses language that treats Israel and its supporters in some mainstream. In our time, political speech and writing are largely the defense of the indefensible, wrote George Orwell in his classic essay on politics in the English language in 1946. The errors and contexts may have their differences, but Orwell's insights apply as well to the use of language that I have been talking about, especially his observation that if thought corrupts language, language can also corrupt thought. Like that before it, the language of today's anti-Semitism depends upon distortions of the truth to fulfill its purpose. A hijacking of meaning, as Bernard Henri Levy called it when commenting on the post flotilla demonizations of Israel. Some of those who call Israel an apartheid state or who equate Israel with Nazi Germany must realize that there are differences and they can be said to be cynically corrupting language to promote such likenesses and to get others to believe them. But there are also people who truly believe even the extremist delusional concepts about Israel and its supporters that they proclaim, who through their paranoid obsessions, often it seems projections of their own hatreds and intentions, have allowed themselves to be separated from reality. While the discourse of anti-Semitism is always trenched in corruptions of the truth, and those who use and believe those corruptions are always separated from reality to some extent, there is something particularly troubling about the ways that the kinds of views circulating today not only are held by people clearly beyond the fringe, but are also finding expression in the academy and elsewhere in the mainstream. That process is facilitated when mainstream figures who explicitly or implicitly use that language deny such intent and even dismiss the very existence of this new anti-Semitism. Insisting that they and others like them are only criticizing Israel the way one can legitimately criticize any country, the pattern is common. And a clear example is provided by Mearsheimer and Waltz, who devote a whole section of their book to advancing the misleading charge 
They had, I quote, pro-Israel groups now claim there is a new anti-Semitism which they equate with criticism of Israel, as though that's all that we do. Um, their insistent, repetitive use of the word criticism in this section as a description of what is being objected to becomes a stylistic tick. You should see how many times I circled when I was going through looking for that. But that still doesn't make it accurate. The reason they say this happens is because they charge Israel supporters want to silence their word, the country's critics, and they further advance their argument by turning charges about the use of concepts into name-calling about personal personalities who use those concepts, deliberately conflating the two by saying, for example, quote, anyone who criticizes Israeli actions or says that pro-Israel groups have significant influence over U.S. Middle East policy stands a good chance of being labeled an anti-Semite. While this labeling admittedly happens sometimes, it is not nearly as common as is implied by these authors and by others um, who would prevent readers from taking unfair criticism of Israel or expressions of the new anti-Semitism seriously. After the recent flotilla incident, to give up one more uh, example of this pattern, old same cartoonist Old Fan drew a pirate with a store of David on his head covering climbing on board ship with a sword in hand, saying, if you don't like piracy on the high seas, you're an anti-Semite. Uh, on the one hand, rejection of the existence of anti-Semitic meaning and statements partaking of the new anti-Semitism can be seen as a preemptive tactic, which represents an acknowledgment that however much the taboo against anti-Semitism might have eroded in recent years, the charge still carries weight. On the other hand, though, attempts to obfuscate the difference between fair criticism of Israel and hate-filled rhetoric, a distinction Israel supporters need to keep in mind, too, leads to further corruption of language. Moreover, this new approach can be seen as problematic and even hostile in its own fashion. In a way, active denial of the existence of the new anti-Semitism can be regarded as a variant on Holocaust denial. In the minds of those who hold these positions, the 20th century's Nazi-driven scapegoating and victimization of Jews, and the early 21st century's demonization of Israel and its supporters are both considered myths made up by the Jews. For them, the first myth was created to elicit sympathy for the Jews and support for the state of Israel, a lead motif for Ahmadinejad and a notion rendered in shorthand by graffiti spray painted in Rome last January that said, the Holocaust equals Zionist propaganda. So, similarly, in the eyes of those who object to the claims that there is a new anti-Semitism, it too is a fiction, in this case created to block criticism of Israel and thus to maintain support for that country. Furthermore, in both cases, there is an underlying belief that the ability of the Jews to get the world, at least the West, to buy into these fictions is proof of their skill in controlling others and thus of their nefarious conspiratorial powers. And I close this paragraph. In fact, the world today truly is witness to the emergence of a new form of anti-Semitism, one that is no less potent than that of earlier eras. It is conveyed through language and images that are at once traditional in substance and contemporary in modes of expression. The shift in the specific nature of the target may make it difficult for some of those with preconceptions based on what the situation was in earlier times who are programmed to recognize only the classic forms of anti-Semitism that come from traditional sources to understand what is happening today, especially with people who circulate the new anti-Semitism not wanting it to be acknowledged. But it is incumbent upon those who do recognize what is going on, what it means, and what is at stake, to speak out and to properly identify the danger that is out there. It is not just Israel's security and the safety of the Jewish people, but reality, and as Erwin Cutler taught us last night, justice, and just plain common decency that demand no less.
Thank you, Michael. Um, our final speaker is Barack Senior. Um, he's a personal friend of mine and the reason why I'm here. Uh, he's the uh, Middle East Director of the Henry Jackson Society of London, and he will be speaking on the disconnect between the academic community, which is well represented here, and the policy establishment on anti-Semitism. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd first like to thank Bernie and Barbara Graveman, who have been really supportive of my work, and love you guys. Thank you. Uh, another person I'd like to thank is Charles Small for having me here. Um, Yale's central anti-Semitism has grown at an exponential rate, and I really think it's due to his personality. He's a guy that doesn't have an ego, genuinely cares about the issues, and as a result of that, it's just grown at such a rapid rate. But alas, due to his treacherous behaviour, he's not here to enjoy the compliment firsthand. You may have to watch the video, that's if he does. Um, it's really, it's, um, what I want to speak about is the dichotomy between the policy community and the academic community. Um, just out of interest, how many people here, if there can be just a show of hands, how many people here come from the policy community, political slash policy? All right, academics um, and NGO. One, two. You guys are from NGO as well, aren't you? That's not policy, political. So if, gen, generally, if I thin slice what's going on, I just sort of find that this, the, that the community that's dealing with anti-Semitism is the academic community, and there's a massive disparity in the policy establishments not dealing with it, especially in terms of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, the international community, the political establishments of the international community, are more than ready to identify anti-Semitism around the world, but there's a disconnect when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, as I will demonstrate. Israelis are often confounded that as a Western liberal democracy, they are subjected to a double standard when criticism is leveled against it. Its policies are formulated with a liberal democratic mindset that it's their Jewish democratic, their Jewish religious mindset doesn't really inform the formulation of policies in Israel. And due to the fact that it's not so conscious on its Jewish identity, um, therefore, and they're more focused on their liberal democratic one, um, they're quite confounded by the disproportionate criticism that they receive. And therefore, they term the disproportionate criticism of them anti-Israel. Um, attacks against Israel are called terrorist attacks, anti-Israel attacks. However, the perpetrators of attacks don't merely have nationalistic or territorial ambitions, they also maintain an anti-Semitic ideology, and that's actually a central component in their activities. Furthermore, the raison d'etre of Zionism was really never again, despite the fact that it had historic antecedents. Um, it came to fruition after the Holocaust, and the whole concept of Never Again was Jews will never be silent in the face of anti-Semitism. However, when, ironically, Zionism has enabled anti-Semitism to mutate into new forms of anti-Semitism, which both Owen Kotler and Sharansky have spoken about and have defined very, very well, then Zionism has failed to be an antidote to anti-Semitism, um, and its raison d'etre has failed. It certainly fails when it doesn't identify and call out the anti-Semitic drivers of Hezbollah, of the Palestinian Authority, that often orchestrates attacks against Israel. Similarly, uh, just a manifestation of that, the foreign ministry in Israel has done fantastic work in its, center, in its department of anti-Semitism. However, it's four years old, and it's brought much, many, many issues to the forefront. And you think to yourself, bloody hell, four years, 
state of Israel, whose raison on d'etre was founded to counter anti-Semitism and be an antidote for anti-Semitism, why did it take so long for this department to be established? Secondly, it's woefully underfunded and it's woefully, woefully understaffed to a disgraceful level, which demonstrates that the Israelis are not so serious when it comes to identifying anti-Semitism in Israel and in the international community. Furthermore, anti-Semitism is documented by the academic community. You have into anti-Semitism, when I talk about anti-Semitism in the academic community, I'm talking about anti-Semitism in you know, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in the Arab world. You have individuals like Benny Morris, Robert Westrich, and Bernard Lewis that have done a fantastic job of documenting this. However, in policy circles, you go to the think tank world in DC, you go to the think tank world in Israel, you go to the think tank world anywhere in the world, you go to the political establishments, you go to the policy establishments, it's not at all mentioned. And a perfect example of this is these two books here. On my right is Dennis Ross, his book Statecraft, fantastic book. Um, another book by Aaron David Miller, The Much Too Promised Land, both leading Clintonite specialists um, that sought to advance a peace process. If you look in their indexes, you won't see anti-Semitism mentioned once. When anti-Semitism is mentioned in their books, it's mentioned in the context of the fact that historically Jews sought to inhabit the land of Israel because they were traumatized for, from anti-Semitic attacks. However, in terms of a motivation of the Palestinians, a driver for conflict, it's completely overlooked. It's not even mentioned. Furthermore, anti-Semitism is often treated as a soft-powered issue, when in actual fact it's a hard-powered issue that poses a strategic threat to the State of Israel. Palestinian nationalism is predicated on anti-Zionism, which is closely linked to anti-Semitism, and manifests through incitement to violence, Holocaust denial, and terrorist activities. The goal of the PLO is the liberation of Palestine through armed struggle. The PLO was formed in 1964, three years before the, the so-called occupation of territories acquired in the Six-Day War of 1967. Anti-Semitism has also been a motive for Palestinian, uh, a Palestinian motive for the strategic sequence to eliminate the state of Israel. From the end of the 1930s until the mid-1970s, according to Ephraim Karsh, the logic of destruction sought to conquer Israel territorially. This also led the leadership of mandatory Palestine's Arab leadership to support Nazi Germany. This was replaced by the phased approach, calling the court for Israel's retreat in stages in response to Arab military force or terrorism. Every territorial achievement would be a springboard for further conflict that would achieve greater concessions and increasing Israeli strategic vulnerability. The Oslo Accords were conducted by the Palestinians as a diplomatic continuum to the phased approach. It served as a springboard for the continuation of terrorism against Israel, along with the PA refusing to recognize Israel's rights to exist. And Abbas still refuses to recognize Israel's rights to exist. And yet, the policy establishment overlooks this, obfuscates this, and so often brands him a moderate. A Palestinian state would also serve as a base to continue the conflict with Israel. Palestinian demands for Israel to withdraw up to the 1967 borders would be followed by the right of return in which Palestinians would demographically cause the Jewish state of Israel to exist. The, the original PLO Charter, issued in May 1964, sought to prohibit the existence and activity of Zionism, and Zionism is mentioned in, 60, in six of the 33 articles. Barry Rubin writes that terrorism was a careful strategy based on the Palestinian perception of the Jews. In 1970, a PLO official declared, Jews cannot live forever under the tension of violence. Zionist efforts to transform them into a homogenous and cohesive nation have failed, and so any objective study of the enemy will reveal that his potential for endurance 
except briefly, is limited. I've always found it fascinating to observe how the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is abstracted from regional trends. In the region, you see the rise of Islamism. And yet, within the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, not simply American policymakers and European policymakers, but Israeli policymakers, they address the issue as if it's territorial and it's nationalistic. When Shimon Peres spoke about his utopic dream of a new Middle East, he never once addressed the fact that there was Islamism. And how do you insulate the Palestinians and Israeli Arabs from regional Islamism that's on the rise? How do you insulate them? And yet, there's a lesion on the part, of, a psychological lesion on the part of Israeli policymakers, as well as the international community, because on one hand, they'll identify Islamism, on the other hand, they address the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in territorial terms, and as if it's not one singular seamless threat. Benny Morris also concurs that the Arabs in Palestine remain part of a larger pan-Islamist or pan-Arab national movement. Now, when these are very, very uncomfortable facts for policymakers to identify, let alone address, and I'll go into multiple reasons later. However, the re however, when they are denying these facts, when they're obfuscating these facts, they're denying facts on the ground. Abbas is painted as a moderate. Despite the fact that Abbas, in his election campaign, was using Islamist rhetoric, praising Shahids, and more recently in Jordan, him saying to Arab journalists, we are unable to confront Israel military. And this point was discussed at the Arab League summit. There I turned to Arab states and I said, if you want war, and if, you, and if all of you will fight Israel, we are in favor. But the Palestinians will not fight alone because they don't have the ability to do it. And then in an interview with the Jordanian daily Al Dasta, he said, At this present juncture, I'm opposed to armed struggle because we cannot succeed in it, but maybe in the future things will be different. Yet, Dennis Ross obfuscates this in his memoirs and in Statecraft by saying, quote unquote, Abu Mazen might have won a mandate for his vision of non violence but he lacked authority and needed to build it by showing that his way, the way of non-violence, paid off. There's a mismatch between prescriptions that are given, the leaders that the Western world touts, and the facts on the ground. We want to project our own huma humanistic approach onto the Middle East. Similarly, Michael Herzog, a former general that does a lot of writing and work at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, he wrote in February 2006, Abbas bases his policy on mutual recognition with Israel, existing Palestinian-Israeli agreements, the Quartet's roadmap to peace, and the vision of a two-state solution. He has emphasized the need to pursue diplomacy, not violence, as a means of dealing with Israel and achieving Palestinian national political goals. The same pacifist approach was adopted towards Arafat, despite the fact that it was, there was evidence of Arafat offering direct financial and logistical support to Hamas, right? Wasn't addressed by the Americans. And Dennis Ross merely rebukes his passivity in not preventing terrorism. Quote, Arafat's greatest travesty as a leader is that he did nothing to delegitimize those who used violence against the Israelis. Never throughout the Oslo process did he declare that those carrying out terror and violence against Israelis were wrong, were illegitimate, were enemies of the Palestinian cause. He might arrest them from time to time. He might tell us that he had zero tolerance for terror. But the message for Palestinians was that he was under pressure from us, all the Israelis, and he had to do this. Not that Palestinian aspirations were being threatened by violence and that Palestinian interests demanded that it not be tolerated. It wasn't simply that Arafat was passively negligent. He was an active sponsor of terrorism. 
This is very poorly represented by those that write up the history of the past and that continue to formulate policies for the present and future. Israel overlooks Palestinian anti-Semitism. Just very recently, member of Knesset Zvulun Orlev, who chairs the Knesset Education Committee, had, had held a meeting to discuss incitement to kill Jews in the Palestinian educational curriculum used throughout all the schools in Judea and Samaria. He bemoaned the fact that, quote, the Prime Minister's Office, the Foreign Minister's Office, and the Office for Strategic Affairs did not come to this meeting even though they were invited. Similarly, Sharansky relays when a committee was formed in the late 1990s to address Palestinian incitement, it almost never met. Despite the fact, ironically, that Abbas refuses to recognize the Jewish identity of the State of Israel. Why? Because he's holding out for the contingency of a one-state solution, whereby Israel's Jewish identity becomes undermined. So, and even Abbas, however ironically, said that despite the absence of direct negotiations with Israel, he repeatedly offered to resume the work of a joint committee to prevent incitement, which was established 12 years ago and after Netanyahu consented to it at the Hawaii summit. But even to this, Abbas says, Israel has not responded. Another point that I find, which I discovered um, and really jumped out at me, was that the classification of anti-Semitism really does matter. Many times, attacks against Israel, if, if there's an attack in, around the world, it's classified as an anti-Semitic attack. It's totally overlooked in Israel, and it's called a terrorist attack. Even Sharansky does this, and he applies a different standard in identifying anti-Semitism in Europe from anti-Semitic attacks, or rather what he calls terrorist attacks that take place in Israel. Quote, in Europe, the connection between Israel and anti-Semitism is equally conspicuous. For one thing, the timing and nature of the attacks on European Jews, whether physical or verbal, have largely revolved around Israel. For example, the anti-Semitic wave itself, which began soon after the Palestinians launched their terrorist campaign against the Jewish state in September 2000, reached a peak in April 2002 during Operation Defensive Shield. The State Department's contemporary global anti-Semitism report makes no mention of anti-Semitic attacks on Israelis and Jews inside Israel, despite the Intifada or increased attacks on Israel due to the recent war in Lebanon. Similarly, according to the State Department's 2009 Human Rights Report, while hate crimes are discussed in general, terrorist attacks in Israel are not considered by the report as anti-Semitic. This is echoed throughout all the Jewish organizations, such as the ADL, which created a long list of attacks in Israel in the 21st century, came up with the one that happened in March the 6th, 2008, in Merkaz Harav, within the Green Line. Eight men, seven of them teenagers, were killed when a Palestinian gunman entered the Merkaz Harav Yeshiva in Jerusalem and opened fire. The terrorist also wounded nine in the attack before he was killed at the scene. Yet the title of this list is Major Terrorist Attacks in Israel. However, they're not identified as being anti-Semitic. This is also not mentioned in the State Department's report. Again, you see on Tel Aviv University's Stephen Roth Institute for the Study of Contemporary Antisemitism and Racism, there's no category for anti-Semitism. There's no category for Israel under the country's reports. You have Iran, you'll have Europe, you won't have Israel. And, on the eight, and, and as a result of that, when there's an attack in Israel, for example, in July 2008 in Hebron, when, during the Ramadan prayers, Muslims converged on the Cave of the Patriarchs and urinated next to the Torah scrolls, leaving behind Hamas flags, it's not to be seen there, right? You'll have many other classifications, many other categories, such as Arab, international, America. There's no section dealing with anti-Semitism in Israel. When it looks promising, 
that anti-Semitic attacks in Israel are going to be identified, they end up being overlooked. So, a State Department report entitled 9-11 Discrimination and Response promisely creates a nexus between anti-Semitism and attacks in states. Anti-Semitic violence was almost wide, entirely associated with anti-Israeli terrorism and was not geographically widespread. Yet the report does not expand upon this association. Instead, it identifies anti-Semitism by focusing solely upon statements and propaganda. So not only does it focus on propaganda, it also draws a spurious distinction between anti-Israel and anti-Semitism, stating terrorist organizations' propaganda in the region frequently was anti-Semitic as well as anti-Israel, Israeli. The section Occupied Territories distinguishes between, in inverted commas, anti-Semitic statements and terrorist attacks. The report states, Palestinian ter terrorist organizations, including Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, attacked Israelis and sometimes issued anti-Semitic statements following their attacks. That's the emphasis, the anti-Semitic statements following the attacks, not the attacks themselves. And yet the academic community identifies very well how anti-Semitism is a central motive behind attacks against Israel. There are multiple reasons why it's convenient for the policy establishment to reframe anti-Semitism and place it in a territorial nationalistic manner. Firstly, Number one, Arab strategic interests, rather than the region, America has strategic interests with the Arab world. Many times, it's happened a number of times, it happened before um, Operation Iraqi Freedom, and it's happened as well in the first Gulf War, and people are speaking about it happening before, you know, to have sanctions on Iran. Many times Israel relegates its security interests or even its own policies that are less strategic to the um, American national security interests. I remember a couple of years ago, Philip Zelikow, who was special advisor to Condoleezza Rice, he said at the Sarraf conference that Israel will have to relegate its strategic interests towards American national security interests in order for America to actually aggregate a coalition of supporters in the Arab world to have regime change in Iraq. Secondly, many of these senior policy officials are ex-Soviet specialists. They're not. They're ex-Cold War specialists. They are not Middle East specialists. For example, as well, James Baker, southern guy, did not have any expertise in the Middle East. Another problem is we actually don't know how to contend with anti-Semitism. We don't know how to address a genocidal, zero-sum game that emanates from Iran, that emanates from the Palestinian territories, that emanates from Hezbollah. We don't know how to deal with that. It's irrational. Um, we mock Neville Chamberlain. However, you know, as being an appeaser. However, you know, after his famous peace in our time speech, he sent newsreels to FDR, basically with the implication, hey, look, watch this guy, we still need to be cautious. Nazism, however, was perceived as a bulwark against um, communism, just like later on, the um, pan-Arabism and Islam was perceived by the Americans as a bulwark against communism. In a humanistic, liberal, democratic mindset that we have, we don't have the policy options, we don't have the philosophical milieu that leads to policy options that could potentially endow us with the ability to conduct policies that could prevent, preempt anti-Semitism. Often it's addressed as on a sociological level, not as a hard-powered security issue. 
Therefore, another thing that the policy establishment does is it embraces a stability-based approach as opposed to a transformational approach to policy. This stability-based approach, so I don't rock the boat, the stability-based approach favoured pan-Arab nationalism to offset Islamism, as through its totalitarian nature, it coalesced tribes, families, villages, regions, sects and ethnic groups that otherwise would have competed with the state for the people's loyalty into modernised states. In 1963, the Council on Foreign Relations Study Group on the ascent to power of Nasser in Egypt and Ba'ath in Syria said the most incredible thing. It said the authoritarian practices characteristic of Nasser's government and particularly his management and control of the press and public opinion are often cited as fundamental weaknesses, but they must be relegated to the stage of political and social development in which the Arabs find themselves to the outside interference to which they are subjected. This is why, similarly to that approach, the Palestinian Authority has been seen by the West as a force for peace, despite this not being the case. We have a tendency in the West to project rationalism onto a Middle East mindset. The Middle East has a totalitarian, authoritarian mindset. We in the West have a rational one that's geared towards growth, stemming from political liberty and John Locke's social contract of property and life. So too, in, we, have an economic, we have an economic model that's consummate to it, which is growth. Yet, the totalitarian authoritarian landscape of the Middle East lends itself more to resistance as opposed to growth. And with resistance, that's coupled with the embracing of mythologies. When you don't have high rates of literacy in the Arab world, when you don't have a middle class, and it's a middle class that comes up with questions, that you have stagnation. And in that stagnation, that's where you have mythologies that are embraced. Yet, Dennis Ross will go on to say, Palestinians had to give up the myth of the right of return to Israel. The animating belief of the PLO and the Palestinian di diaspora throughout their history. Similarly, in ending conflicts and actually making peace, one has to get each side to reconcile to reality. Reconciling myths is impossible. Discarding myths, that's the challenge. Basically, don't be Middle Eastern don't come from a totalitarian environment. As I've got no time now, I'm going to just cut quite a bit. Terrorism and anti-Semitism is, is a manifestation of the resistance mentality fostered in the Arab world. The resistance is that violence and wars can redeem our Arab, Arab honour at the expense of constructive reform. Thus, Hezbollah can claim victory, causing Israel to retreat when Israel exited southern Lebanon in 2000. Again, Hamas, which in 2004 had mere 20% of the vote, suddenly won the 2006 election in the aftermath of disengagement, leading to 1,500 Qassam rockets being fired into the Negev. It was during the 1993 Oslo process that the first major suicide bombings occurred, bombings occurred in Israel. They were to be resumed in 2000 after Israel withdrew from Lebanon. The final thing that I'm going to say is there's a tremendous irony with a policy establishment embracing myths themselves. Compromise does not lead to resolution, and reconciliation does not lead to peace, but often crisis. Bernard Lewis observed, in some quarters, the peace process itself has aroused a new Arab hostility to Jews, among both those frustrated by its slowness and those alarmed by its rapidity. As a result, anti-Semitism in recent years has conquered new territory and risen to a new intensity. 
Similarly, the Intelligence and Terrorism Information Center produced a report in April 2008 entitled Contemporary Arab Muslim Anti-Semitism, Its Significance and Its Implications, that noted even if progress is made, progress in negotiations can lead to a growth in Islamism and anti-Semitism in the Middle East. Thank each of the four speakers. Um, we had to start this session a half an hour, or more than a half late. They each cut about 10 minutes out of their presentations. There was a lot of good material that we missed. Um, they'll be available during the break. They'll be at the barbecue later. I urge each of you to go up to them, and I'd love to give them a hearty round of applause.